The correct mobile category finalist is Rick Bruner, VP of Research and Analytics for Violent or Villant US. Thank you very much. My goodness, this is definitely the most beautiful theater that I've ever presented in. I'm tempted to burst into an area, but uh, you're in luck, I won't. So I'm here to speak about what we expect is really going to be a breakthrough in measurement in digital advertising, a preview of some new measurement technology that we're rolling out uh, later this quarter using advancements in randomized control groups, which are the gold standard for scientific measurement of effect. Uh, first, <clears throat> indulge me if, uh, for just a moment in identifying who Viant is, because uh, the name may not be familiar to you. It's a new brand of our operating company that we launched uh, earlier this year. Some of the uh, subsidiary companies may be more familiar to you. Specific Media, founded in 1999, is one of the largest person-based marketing platforms in the US for uh, video, display, desktop, and mobile advertising. Uh, so everything I'm talking about here are integrated desktop and mobile campaigns where we've tied back to the same individual. Uh, we do that in large part through Vindico, which is the largest video ad server in the US market, uh, and also a quality rating scoring uh, tool called Adtricity for viewability and, and overall campaign quality. Zumo is a, uh, our investment in the conversions of TV and uh, desktop uh, uh, advertising play in the smart television space. And one of these things not being like the other, MySpace, a brand I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, and as uh, relates to our, our uh, example here, you're all in our database. Uh, we have relaunched MySpace, is actually the fastest growing uh, media uh, company according to Comscore in the United States last year uh, as a destination entertainment site, it's no longer a social network, but we've used the registration database from the historic MySpace of over a billion worldwide identities for our person-based advertising solution. And uh, these component pieces come together in the technology we're um, showcasing today. So here are a couple of provocative headlines that were published last year asking a very legitimate question. How confident should advertisers be about how accurate the measurement is of their advertising campaigns? Uh, this was from a piece of research from a researcher named Tadalus. Uh, other researchers in the academic field have been critical like this uh, uh, piece of research that they're referencing here for this industry's reliance on measurement that lacks true randomized control groups, uh, which is the point of our solution today. So what we do emphasize in our industry generally with measurement is either uh, measurements that have no control group construct, such as attribution modeling, pathway analysis, media mix measurement, or uh, modeled control groups. So taking the first point, without a control group of any kind, you're really just measuring correlation. You're measuring who is exposed to the ad and then who went on and converted in whatever sense you're, you're measuring conversion. Uh, given the advances that we've made in targeting as an industry and, and a lot of the purchase-based targeting that we're doing, it stands to reason that many of the people that you're targeting would have already converted anyway. But you're over attributing conversions when you're saying everybody who is tagged with the campaign who went on to purchase an e-commerce purchase tag tracking, for example, uh, credited with ROI for the campaign is grossly overstating how many, how many of those conversions would not maybe not have taken place otherwise. Alternatively, a lot of the measurement relies on modeled control groups. So in many uh, me measurement partners who have Excellent, unique data sets of consumer behavior, like purchasing behavior, will typically tag the campaign, see who in their panel was actually exposed, so the test group, or the exposed group, if you will, is deterministically identified by those who were actually shown the ad, but then they will model the control group uh, based on weighting of 
uh, demographics, uh, gender and age, and uh, past purchase behavior. Uh, the chart on, on the bottom right, if you need an illustration of the fallibility of our ability to model human behavior is the stock market in the last 10 years. And if any of you happen to have money in the stock market around 2008, 2009, you may recognize that the greatest minds in economics got risk assessment very, very wrong as to how consumers were gonna behave. And honestly, the complexities of what we're doing in algorithmic targeting is I don't think that much less complex than uh, mortgage credit swap derivatives. Uh, with time running out, let me quickly explain what we're doing. So two types of randomization we've built into our ad technology. On the left, randomly controlled trials, the technical term for classic test control, but the emphasis being on the random assignment of the control group. What we do is we interpret, in this case, the IP address. Uh, we, we have other means of doing this, but in, in these examples, looking at the IP address where we've served both mobile and desktop ads uh, that we can relate back to an IP address. IP addresses are not random, so we run them through a random hash and then look at the last two digits in that 16-digit hash and assign them to a series and run two parallel campaigns. The control group is eligible only for people who those last two randomized digits are 00 through 09 in this example, and the test group is eligible to serve the ads if the hashed IP address is 10 through 99. And then all the other targeting is delivered identically to those two groups. So it's truly random assignment, and then the two groups are treated exactly, and the control group sees a placebo ad public service announcement or a different advertiser's ad. And then we look at the rates of conversion in those two populations, subtract the conversion rate of the control group, which is the baseline conversions that would be happening, and the actual effect of your campaign is the difference. Multi-level randomization answers a different question, uh, where we actually, every ad server call in the test group has an opportunity to be shown a placebo ad. Uh, it's a weighted uh, difference, so they may have a 10% chance to see the, the placebo ad. What we end up with, when we look at, for example, the effective frequency, and I'm afraid I'm, um, my time is just about, well, it's actually up. So, <laughs> um, what we end up with, just very briefly, for example, looking at frequency, we can see one population who is exposed at a frequency of four, and another population who is exposed at a frequency of three to the test ad and one to the placebo ad, letting us erase any kind of biases that may exist between high frequency and low frequency people to see what the effect of one extra frequency point is. Similarly, uh, where you may see tablet uh, users converting at a higher rate, there could be a household wealth bias in tablet ownership that explains the higher conversion rate. So this technique will similarly uh, create a placebo group of that tablet exposed group. And I don't really have time to uh, go into, oops, I think this clicker has the same problem. Uh, I don't really have time to go into the res results in detail, but you can see we were able to, uh, with this method, determine significant effect of the campaigns. So um, I'm sorry for the abbreviated uh, uh, delivery, but uh, if we have any time for questions, I'll take a question. Thanks, Sir Metric. I think what we need to do, though, is uh, maybe forego the questions. If you have questions for Rick, you might need to track him down after, because we need to keep kind of rolling along. So everyone, uh, join me, please, in thanking Rick. Thank you very much. <laughs>